Welcome back. So we're going to continue our discussion of endogenous growth with Marshallian externalities. Let me share my screen. Okay. So uh, on the left here, you see uh, the typical problem that the decentralized version, uh, you know, the typical problem in the decentralized version of the model. Right, so each and every capitalist basically chooses a particular path of consumption, and uh, um, starting with an initial capital stock, uh, and they do not really internalize the uh, externality here, but the social planner does something different, okay? The planner also maximizes the same thing, all right? So in that sense, it is perfectly uh, benevolent, okay? But the planner has the chance to internalize the effect of capital stock on uh, production, okay, productivity. So this is the social planner. And now, of course, uh, this can be written further as um, um, phi um, sub C um, Uh, so when we write that, so there's something that depends on n, I don't remember the exponent here, but eventually we have this, right? Alpha plus eta. So if you write the Hamiltonian here for the, for this economy, you have uc plus q, right? A kt alpha minus ct. And here, when you write the Hamiltonian, you have U plus QT, but now you have uh, CN something, uh, KT alpha plus eta minus CT. And as you see, these two are different, right? This term will have a different exponent right now, uh, social planner internalizes the externality. So the optimal paths will differ and the long run growth will also differ. Okay, so remember in the long run growth, uh, we will have uh, a particular earlier equation. You know how to solve such stuff. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna solve all these problems, but uh, you realize that uh, long run growth rate in this economy, right? Uh, C dot over C will be different, right? So uh, decentralized equilibrium is different than uh, social planner equilibrium, okay? Uh, as I said, Romer, uh, Romer's paper is the you know fully fledged general equilibrium model that explains all the necessary details. So it's a very nice paper. So I would I would really recommend you to take a look. Uh, but for our purposes to understand the philosophy behind it, this this is uh, enough. The important idea is that once you solve this, okay, that growth rate will be endogenous. So either in the uh, decentralized solution or competitive equilibrium or in the social planner version, it is endogenous, okay? But the problem is still uh, this. So even if it is endogenous, it is not Schumpeterian, right? Because in the Schumpeterian models, we have purposeful inventive activity.
for profit motive, right? So what's the purpose? Profit motive. All right. So Marshallian externality models, and we're going to see another example in a moment. So they do not have this feature. For this reason, uh, Romer himself first was convinced that uh, we should understand this Schumpeterian mechanism as well. Uh, otherwise, it will not be really satisfactory because if you, if you imagine uh, modern capitalism, uh, firms uh, invest in R&D and invest in technology because they know uh, systematic research eventually give them uh, more productivity and a higher market share so that they will have higher profits. Okay. Um, this doesn't mean, by the way, that to get uh, endogenous growth, there will always be uh, a profit motive. Well, profit motive will be there, but markets can be competitive. Okay. So there's a literature uh, that particularly deals with perfectly competitive innovation. Okay, so if you if you look at the papers by um, Baldwin and Levine, uh, these authors uh, study perfectly competitive innovation, and the basic uh, foundational assumption here is that uh, if I invent something. At that instant, that gives me a competitive advantage. That gives me a competitive edge in the market because I can keep it for some time. I can keep the innovation uh, in secrecy for some time. Okay. Of course, eventually it will spill over to other firms and other industries, but that still gives me some chance to obtain higher profits. Uh, in the in the initial phase okay so now let's see the lucas model uh, so the logic is basically the same okay so this is a nice paper published in journal of monetary economics uh and i think in section four uh so there are a couple of models in that paper i think the one I'm just going to show you is in section four. I'm not exactly sure. You know, it's been a while that I, I read this paper. Uh, this paper also is in continuous time. Okay, so this model is also in continuous time. And the idea is that now we are interested in the growth of human capital. Okay. Uh, and the Production function is like this. So there will be an aggregate output, okay? So there could be uh, a TFP term here. Uh, you can denote by AT. Then there will be KT. Uh, let's say KT to be alpha here. And then there will be uh, labor. But labor now uh, will be written in this way. Um, okay. So here, L is raw labor. Okay. So uh, A is some productivity, as in, let's say, solo, and let's say it grows at a constant rate. And L is population. And suppose that it also grows at a constant rate. Now, H is human capital per worker. Okay, H is human capital per worker. And UT, which is between zero and one, is, the, uh, is a choice variable. So if U is positive and between zero and one, let's say, so some part of, so U is, is basically time endowment, all right? Time endowment spent on working, all right? 
So I have L workers, each have HD level of human capital. And if they work, let's say eight hours per day, they can supply this effective units of labor. Okay, so that's pretty simple. Uh, then you ask, of course, how human capital changes, right? And the production function for human capital is rather simple. So you have, uh, delta here is positive, and here, of course, alpha is between zero and one, right? So what you have here is this. So in your remaining time, one minus u, um, you educate yourself either in school or in on the job training. So that could be, you know, that, that could be uh, many different mechanisms uh, about how you increase your human capital. Okay, for instance, if health health is is what you what you focus on here, uh, so uh, either physical or mental health. So you spend some time not working so you regenerate yourself as a as a worker uh you know you get rest etc etc so you would you would imagine this production technology in many different ways but it is general enough to give you uh the the trade-off right so what's the trade-off the trade-off here is that either i can work more today so if i increase you right so here's the trade-off if i increase you I produce more, right, for today. If I decrease you, I produce more human capital for tomorrow, right? So this is the uh, familiar dynamic trade-off that you know from the uh, from your earlier studies. Uh, and then K is, of course, the other state variable, right? So there's K dot, now there's consumption, and that must be equal to uh, uh, output, right? Um, now, this is the version, of course, where there is no externality. In this version, there is no externality. Now, if we want to introduce the externality, we write the production function in this way. Okay. Now, the idea is this. So there is this term uh, where H bar is the average human capital in the economy, okay? And gamma is positive, okay? So gamma is positive, H bar is the average human capital. And this particular externality just tells you what? Well, if you are around, you know, more educated people, okay, if you are in, University of Chicago, or if you are in Hajjatipa University, there are other talented people around you, right? If you are in cities, in, in metropolitan areas, there are many talented designers, architectures, scientists, um, managers all around you, okay? So that creates a sort of externality for you. Imagine that, uh, you are working at the uh, university and there is a near uh, coffee shop that you frequently go. And in, in that particular coffee shop, you meet uh, artists, you meet designers, you meet engineers. And that type of uh, agglomeration in, in Solo's model create those type of education externalities, either in school or in the workplace. Okay, of course, in that particular version, we write this 
uh, as an externality that directly implies higher productivity. Okay, you can do that for the human capital technology as well. Uh, now the question is again simple, right? So there will be a decentralized version. There will be a decentralized version. In a decentralized version, uh, the utility problem will be solved, right? Uh, with two state variables, okay? With two state variables, and then of course, two initial conditions. But in the decentralized version, uh, H bar will be taken as given. In other words, the worker, when choosing U, right? So here you are choosing consumption and the time you spent on working, uh, you will not internalize the uh, your you decision on average human capital. So you take this as given. Well, in the social planner solution, social planner, of course, so if you, if you write the production function here, so it is basically in the, in the, in that version, it is K alpha U H N one minus alpha H bar gamma, right? So, and minus C, let's say. So when you take derivative with respect to U, okay? Uh, sorry, when you take derivative with respect to H, you basically have one minus alpha. Okay, in the social planner solution, you have what? You have A, K, alpha, U, H, N, one minus alpha, now the average will be the same, right? For, for everybody, because there's no heterogeneity now. Uh, you can introduce heterogeneity, but it doesn't really matter for our purposes. But now you have one minus alpha plus gamma, right? So in the social planner solution, the optimal path is different. And eventually the growth rate you will find here, the competitive growth rate will be different than the optimal growth rate. Okay. Now I'm not going to spend so much time on how to solve these things, but let me let me remind you of one thing. So uh, in the solo, uh, sorry, in the Lucas model, uh, basically you're going to derive the first order necessary conditions. Okay. So first order necessary conditions will be there. Then you're going to impose the assumption of Bell's growth path. Okay. Uh, so you may want to characterize an equilibrium, okay, where these growth rates are fixed. Uh, these growth rates are fixed, okay. And same is true for that. And this is already given in this way, okay? And U star obviously must be between zero and one, okay? Because it is a bounded variable and that bounded variable, <coughs> sorry, uh, will eventually give you uh, the balanced growth path result because this will be positive. So. Uh, imagine again, once again, look at the utility fun uh, sorry, production function. So you have K alpha uh, U and one minus alpha and H one minus alpha plus gamma, right? So uh, you can write this in this way. Uh, and uh, H one minus alpha plus gamma, right? So this is add U to the one minus alpha. So if this is Y, then Y over N is K 
k to be alpha, right? H to be one minus alpha plus gamma, uh, u to the one minus alpha. Now this will be constant, right? This will be constant. Then the growth rate of uh, capital stock, which is itself equal to growth rate of capital minus n, right? Uh, will be that, and then growth rate of human capital, g of h. Uh, so it will be, uh, so if you think about it, the growth rate of GDP per capita will be alpha times the growth rate of capital stock per worker plus one minus alpha plus gamma growth rate of human capital per worker. Okay? So eventually what you want to find are all these unknowns, right? So you're going to find this, you're going to find that, you're going to find that, uh, you're going to find that, you're going to find that. Okay? By imposing the balance growth rate assumption. So if you if you cannot do it, I mean, it is pretty obvious when you when you read the paper. Of course, it, it takes you know some time to see the solution, but it's pretty straightforward once you define your uh, first order condition conditions correctly. So essentially, there will be uh, a subtle point equilibrium, as in the uh, standard Ramsey model, uh, and in this balanced growth path, we can find all these all these unknowns and eventually we're going to realize uh, competitive equilibrium growth rate will be different than optimal growth rate. Okay? So if you work on this uh, and you cannot solve it, I can share my solutions. I have, I have them in print. Uh, but I want you to first try if you, if you are really interested. Um, at some point for any, any modern economist, I think at some point should uh, do it for once, at least, you know, finding a balanced growth path of an endogenous growth model. Um, so the idea is again, decision makers in the competitive equilibrium may not always internalize different types of externalities because they do not internalize these externalities, social planner can, can do better, all right? Of course, here we assume that social planner uh, itself, sorry, uh, social planner itself does not face any costs, right? So usually, uh, Learning about the economy and the fundamentals require time, requires time, uh, requires certain devices. And most of the time, it is not always very transparent what, what can government actually do, right? But suppose that in this, in this framework, you want to increase the growth rate of the economy, okay? So the real, real usefulness of endogenous growth theory is the policy connection. Now, if you, if you compare what happened in Solo and Ramsey models, in these models, even if there is growth, it is purely exogenous, right? So policy cannot affect long-run growth rate. But here the situation is different. Let's look at the, let's look at this, okay? So long-run growth rate is obviously depend on uh, Delta. And it also depends on how much people, I mean, how, how people spend their time, right? Between work and education, work versus education, right? So work is you, education is one minus you. Now, imagine how can, how can policymaker affect the growth rate, right? Well, we can think about education reforms. Okay, education reforms. Suppose that government collects taxes from, from private sector, so, um, 
suppose that uh, we have resource constraint here, right? C plus K dot equals uh, Y. Now, instead of writing that, suppose that there is this text, okay? And that tax revenue, imagine, is used for an education reform. Okay? So more simply, let's denote it by tau. Okay? And suppose that if government spend that, that money entirely on education reforms, okay? Uh, then education becomes more productive, okay? We have better schools, we have smart boards, we have uh, distance education systems, et cetera, et cetera, okay? So then policy becomes important, right? So there is a, there is a certain policy connection, all right? Uh, you may also imagine, um, you know, similar, similar policy decisions in the Romer model, because there as well, uh, growth is endogenous, right? Long run growth rate of the economy uh, will be endogenous. So policy will be there. And in the Schumpeterian models as well, so remember our uh, classification in the beginning, there is Marshallian externality models and there are Schumpeterian models. Right, and there are different versions of Schumpeterian models, but in all of them, uh, policy matters. Okay, except for semi-endogenous growth models. For that reason, we call them semi-endogenous. Uh, we're gonna see that see those models as well. Um, you know, Lucas model is also important because um, this is the model where he started working on growth issues. Uh, prior to that, he was working on economic fluctuations and how we can use dynamic stochastic equilibrium models to understand you know, the evolution of GDP in the short run, etc. Uh, at 1987, I guess, uh, he writes a paper about uh, the welfare cost of business cycles and he discovers that uh, in many, uh, for, for many reliable parameter values, um, the welfare cost of business cycle fluctuations is not that large. But instead, the growth effects is huge, right? Uh, so if you compare, uh, so if you, um, if you think about it, So there is, uh, let's say, this is consumption. So of course, there will be some fluctuation, right? Now, Lucas argues, okay, the problem of welfare loss associated with this variance, okay? There is a, there is a, there is a variance here, right? Uh, the welfare loss associated with this variance is much smaller than the welfare loss associated with a slower long run growth rate. Okay. So this, this, this cost is much higher. So then he argues understanding the slope here uh, is our macroeconomic priority. Okay. For this reason, after, uh, after 1988, he started working on growth and he wrote several growth papers. Uh, and why education? I mean, why, why Lucas model is focusing on education? Because that's the, that's the Chicago school approach, right? Uh, uh, I mean, look at uh, Gary Becker, right? Um, Jim Heckman, um, um, uh, what's the other guy? Uh, Mincer, 
all, all of these Chicago guys were really interested in understanding, uh, you know, the, the role of schooling, the role of education, the, the role of formal education and training systems on, on growth and development. Um, I would highly recommend reading the Lucas paper, especially the introduction, because in the introduction, there's a very nice, uh, you know, um, there's, there's a very nice treatment of uh, the methodology of modern development economics. Um, it's, a, it's a very nice read. So I would, I would recommend that. Uh, other than these details, I'm not gonna put so much effort in these models. They're very nice in a couple of respects. First, serious endogenous growth models. When I say serious, I mean fully fledged dynamic equilibrium frameworks where we can discuss you know, issues such as efficiency, uh, differences between you know, decentralized equilibrium versus social planner equilibrium. Um, so there's also policy connection. So we can, we can always extend these models with different types of policies. So if you want to study uh, in your term paper, for instance, if you want to study something um, purely theoretical, you can actually work on the Lucas model and extend the Lucas model with different types of education policies and education reforms. You can also add some heterogeneity across people. So you may, you may imagine that the society is composed of different types of people that have different types of human capital, right? So there are some high school graduates, there are some high school dropouts, there are some college dropouts, and there are some college graduates. And let's say there are some uh, people with uh, postgraduate degrees, right? So you may imagine that there are five different types of worker in the economy uh, which have different education levels. And those education differences would, would, uh, would have different implications for the, for the production function, right? You may not write the production function in that pretty boring and not very interesting called Douglas form, but instead you may imagine uh, different tasks of production uh, are being handled by different types of occupations and uh, those occupations uh, uh, could be performed, could be, could be enjoyed by different people with, uh, I mean, people with different uh, educational backgrounds. Then the, the things are getting really interesting because now you can tell me, uh, you know, you can answer questions such as, okay, should we spend more money on vocational high schools or uh, PhD, right? So if there's, a, if there's a public money out there, which is valuable, right? How should I spend this money to increase welfare? How should I spend this money to increase growth rate? Uh, how, do I sh how, how should I spend this money, for instance? Maybe, maybe I should directly give them to people, right? I mean, taxing the firms and rebating them to the, uh, to the poor people. Maybe I shouldn't, I shouldn't uh, maybe I should optimally uh, you know, differentiate between you know, people with a PhD degree and people uh, uh, that drop out of high school. So all these all these interesting stuff can be can be added, and there's there's a, of course large literature on each of each of these different topics. Um, yeah, I guess that's it. I guess that's all for today. So we have now about five and a half minutes, so I can answer your questions and respond to your comments. Uh, if something is not very clear, I can re-explain again. I have time. We can reconnect again as well. So let me now pause. Anyone? Okay then. Um, if you do not have any question or comment, we can end our session. So next week, let me check with the syllabus. Uh, next week, 
uh, we're gonna look at yes. So let, next week we're gonna look at different types of Schumpeterian creative destruction models. Um, if you want to take a look at the papers, uh, you may check Romer's 1990 paper in Journal of Political Economy and uh, Agion and Hobbit's paper, 1992 paper in Econometrica. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cover these papers uh, in, in two or three hours. So we will have a good understanding of how the Schumpeterian models work. And that will be our week four. Okay, and your and your paper, you know, proposal submissions are due, but you can you can submit them until uh, until Friday. So let's say so you can submit them until 19th of March. Okay, so you still have around 10 days to finalize your proposals. And in between, you can consult me about your about your paper proposals. Obviously, you can email me. You can you can ask for a meeting over Zoom, etc. Okay. Thanks for the silence. Uh, I'm now gone. Have a nice week. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you.